Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ian Wallace. I am the co-director of the uh, Cybersecurity Initiative here at New America. Um, as you may have seen as you came in with our big banner across the wall, uh, one of our goals here at New America is looking at, at how technology is changing the world and understanding how we, how we respond to that in a, a range of different sort of polity contexts, um, including uh, how you secure the, this new sort of digital uh, world in which we live. Um, but of course, um, it is increasingly clear that not all of that technology is, is necessarily going to come from the United States. Uh, and, and one place where we're, we're learning that, that that technology could well come from is, is China. Uh, that the challenge in that regard, of course, is that while China is helping to uh, define the, the global digital economy, um, what the uh, people in China, particularly the Chinese government, but others are, are doing and thinking is, is not particularly well understood. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, in some cases, it's, it's deliberate, but it's um, even more due to the fact that there are cultural and particularly language barriers uh, which make it difficult for non-China experts to, to really understand what's going on. A lot of uh, material is, is made available uh, in Chinese, but obviously not accessible to, to non-Chinese speakers. Um, and that is why uh, we jumped at the chance uh, when uh, uh, to um, put together what we're calling our DigiChina blog. And uh, just today, uh, to coincide with this event, we have gone live with that blog. Uh, for anyone who wants to find it, go to the Cybersecurity Initiative homepage on the New America website. Uh, and you can see there uh, four blog posts that we've already produced and previously circulated, but all captured in one place. Uh, and this is uh, a blog that we're going to develop, we're going to grow uh, with the help of uh, this uh, crew here and others to, to sort of pull back the veil a little bit on what's going on on Chinese digital economy issues, uh, both in terms of um, providing translations uh, and in terms of uh, analyzing and providing commentary on, on what's there. Um, but in order to mark this uh, historic moment, uh, we thought we would uh, get together in person. We spent a lot of time exchanging emails um, and, and have a conversation about what, what is going on uh, with the, the Chinese uh, digital economy and how it uh, impacts uh, all the rest of us around the world, um, particularly uh, at a time when we're, we're just about to get into the party congress, which um, puts... Uh, China front and center of uh, um, many uh, uh, policy issues that we, we grapple with. Um, to, to have this conversation, um, we have a, a, a particularly formidable uh, group of uh, China experts. Um, going down the row, um, Paul Triolo from the uh, Eurasia Group, uh, Graham Webster, who, Yale Law School, yep. Uh, Sam Sachs from uh, CSIS uh, and uh, John Costello from Flashpoint. John is also a New America Cybersecurity Fellow. Um, Paul and Graham we're going to bring uh, in as uh, New America Fellows in the not too distant future. Uh, Sam uh, has her affiliation with CSIS, but we're very pleased to, to work with her and uh, uh, cooperate between think tanks. Um, I should also mention that another key player in this crew is uh, Roger Krimas of uh, Leiden University, who, um, for obvious reasons, uh, wasn't able to come here quite so easily, uh, but, but we will have here in person in the not too distant future. Uh, so we're going to have uh, a moderated discussion, um, picking up various different strands of the uh, digital economy um, uh, uh, issues, uh, and then um, towards the end, we'll move into a, a Q&A. So have your questions ready, and uh, we'll come give you the opportunity to talk to these guys uh, yourselves. Um, in the meantime, however, if you uh, are on Twitter and uh, tweeting out, we're using the uh, hashtag, hashtag, hashtag DigiChina. So D-I-G-I-C-H-I-N-A. 
Uh, and if anybody is watching online and want to contribute, ask a question, uh, feel free to use that hashtag and we'll, we'll try and take that opportunity. Um, so I'm going to work my way down the line before we sort of get into a, a more back and forth uh, and, and start with Paul. Paul, as we look at sort of um, the Chinese uh, digital economy, what from looking at sort of writings that we've seen and uh, evidence from uh, listening to what people in China are saying to each other, do we think the grand plan is? What's the strategy that underpins the government's cyber uh, and general digital economy approach? Great question, uh, Ian. First of all, I'd like to thank New America for inviting us uh, to, to appear on this panel today. I think this is, um, I'm really excited about the new, the launch of the new Digi China Initiative. Um, and I think one of the things we'll be trying to do in that process is capture all the various pieces of the, the strategy. Because I think one, one important point to make here is that um, China has, has uh, evolved over the last 25 years a very elaborate strategy um, that, that has changed over time, but is really very focused on uh, the digital economy. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it might be useful to, to first step back a little bit and sort of see how, how we got here. Because um, some of these trends are not new, um, but, but I think what's, what's new is the, some of the recent developments since the, the uh, 18th Party Congress, for example. I mean, five years ago, we were in a very diff different situation in some sense in, in terms of China's strategy. But since the 18th Party Congress, particularly with the elevation of Xi Jinping and the group around him that, that decided that, that uh, to look at, I think, to look at it anew at this, the issue of the digital economy and cyberspace and all of its many manifestations and came up with what I think is a really uh, a new strategy um, and one which, um, which is well documented, which is, which is what we'll, we'll be talking about a lot today too. Um, and which I think it's important to understand um, uh, the, the, the which, which documents are important uh, sort of sort of from a high level and then also um, we'll get into today a little bit too about some of the implementation and operationalizing of some of the, the, the broader strategies. So I think uh, I'll just touch on three broad trends that have sort of come together. One is um, these are longer term trends again that preceded the, the recent um, uh, 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 political regime and, and the, the, the formation of some of the new groups. We'll talk about the new organ bureaucratic organization in China. So one is one big trend is, is the, is the, is the, the uh, drive to reduce uh, dependence on foreign technology. So that's, that's been going on for a long time. But I think in, in the cyber domain that has taken on a particular importance, uh, particularly under Xi Jinping. The second one is control the media. And again, that's been going on for a long time. Um, uh, and I think What's, what's key here is the transition in terms of extending traditional controls over the traditional media into cyberspace. And that's, a, that's part of, again, of a long-term trend. And then the third one is the emergence of cybersecurity as a, as a sort of very salient issue in the wake of things like Stuxnet um, and the Snowden revelations and other, other issues uh, in the, in the 20, 2012, 2013 timeframe. So those, those three broad strands, I think, were, were instrumental uh, in, in following the 18th Party Congress and leading uh, China to adopt a new approach to the whole issue of cyberspace. And so this culminated in uh, 2014 with the establishment of this, um, the Central Cybersecurity and Informatization Leading Group under Xi Jinping and an associate office called the Cyberspace Administration of China, which has no real equivalent in English, but it's, it's easy to, to understand, I think, for the, for the non-Chinese speaking audience. Um, and again, I think it's critical to understand that in that, uh, in that leading group, uh, first of all, which is one of many that Xi Jinping has set up uh, in the last um, five years, uh, that included a whole, uh, all, all, it brought together all three of these strands. So there's, um, in particular, um, uh, I think uh, this, is, this is what's led to the focus on media. And then cybersecurity is, 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 a, is a, I think, in, in terms of the name of the leading group, really encompass, encompasses also encompasses that media component. And then informatization is this Chinese term, which is very difficult to translate, but really means digital economy, uh, innovation, a whole range of things. Uh, and and in, encompassed in that is really this issue of, re of reducing China's dependence um, on foreign technology. Uh, so out of that formation of this leading group and the cyberspace of China come a whole series of slogans and really important concepts, I think, that, that are usually attributed to Xi Jinping, but probably come from uh, a group of experts and advisors around him. So things like, without 
cybersecurity, there is no national security. Okay, very important to understand that. And without informatization, no modernization. So those, th that slogan, for example, I think encapsulates the, um, some of the thinking behind the formation of a leading group and a, and a whole new approach to, to cyber issues. Um, and out of that also comes, I think, th three concepts, which I think we can discuss further, but I, I, I want to raise here. Um, one is the concept of cyber sovereignty. Again, this, is, this has come out of a, of, of, uh, in, in a lot of um, different venues and speeches, but basically, uh, cyber sovereignty is, is something that China is, is and, and particularly Xi Jinping, are, is asserting that countries have the right to control the physical infrastructure and information that's, that's, that's within their borders. And it has a lot of other corollaries we can talk about, but it's an important concept that China has been pushing globally in, uh, in, in various forums um, to become an accepted concept. And in some sense, there's, been, there's some movement on that globally. Um, the other important concept um, is um, the right to speak. So China, I think, one, one of the, the, the thrusts of the new leading group and the office was to help to change the, 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 the facts on the ground. I think China perceived that the internet was basically built and, 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 and established and the standards were set by primarily US and other Western companies. And I think part of the, the overall strategy is to change the facts on the ground to give China uh, more of a, more of a the so-called right to speak in global fora um, and in things like internet governance. So that's another key component of the strategy. So the convenient term for the strategy that, that we sometimes use is, uh, that, and I think is really important, and it was highlighted in this Chusher article that we recently translated, was the concept of building China into a cyber power or cyber superpower. I tend to prefer the term superpower because um, I think really the goal is, is, is the long-term goal of this strategy, which again came out of the formation of the leading group and the, and the office, is, to, is, to, is for China to be essentially on par with the US, the, the other cyber superpower. And so I think um, this, this uh, it, part of the, the goal in establishing a leading group in the office was to, to bring that strategy forward and then begin operationalizing it. So one of the key pieces of, of that strategy is, is a legislative framework, which we'll talk about in some detail when, when with Sam. Um, but uh, I, so, so it's, it's important that that to understand both the sort of theoretical framework and, and the important documents surrounding that and the strategies and guidelines and plans. And then I think we're, right now we're in a, an important period of operationalizing uh, some of the concepts that came out of this theory of building China into a cyber superpower. Um, so maybe, maybe I can I'll stop here. There's a lot, lot more to, to discuss on, the, on, 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 the, on the, the strategy, but let me just, just, just note that um, we, in, in the new blog that we've put up, we've tried to, to we've started off with it with a series of documents, including some of the sort of larger theoretical documents, but then also looking at some of the really practical issues that China is now running into in terms of operationalizing the strategy. Things like cross-border data flows, data localization, these are really complex issues. So it's nice, the, the strategy sounds great when you read it in Chu Sure. So I recommend the Chu Sure article as a way to sort of, if you're really eager to jump into the details of, uh, of China's cyber strategy, but then what we're also going to be trying to get at is how does this become operationalized? How do you actually really go from a strategy uh, and, and build um, something like, for example, a cybersecurity framework that includes these very complex issues which are now largely global and impact U.S. companies doing business in China, et cetera. So I think um, uh, it's an exciting period uh, and it'll be really interesting to see, um, and we'll get into this a little later, about how the new party Congress and whether, whether we see new initiatives uh, on, on all these fronts. So I'll stop here and so Graham, as um, Paul said, you know, one of the interesting things about this space is there's, there's a lot of strategy and sort of forward-looking thinking and you know, by stereotype, Chinese are famous for their sort of long-term view. But there's also a with some pretty concrete kind of ideas about things that are happening uh, pretty immediately. And one of the, the, the technology areas where I think people in the US are beginning to um, open their eyes to what's going on in China is, is this area of artificial intelligence. Um, the Chinese have just come out with a, a new strategy. Can you tell us a little bit more about this, um, partly for its own sake, but also for what it says about you know, how, how China is thinking about some of these issues? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Ian, and thanks to New America for having us here and for serving as a, a sort of gathering place for our collaboration that's been going on among a bunch of organizations across a lot of geography. Um, I think the AI issue is one that actually has been pretty well covered in the US and other English language media. 
Um, at least it's covered in that we hear about it a lot. Um, and so what we did in sort of seeing this new state council next generation artificial intelligence development plan being published, this is a beast of a document. It's really long. It's full of details. And we've translated it in full. So, so I should say, um, if the DigiChannel blog we put out, two of the things we've included is both the strategy article that Paul's talking about and indeed this strategy that uh, the Gren is, is talking about now. Sorry. So we, we went through the effort to sort of get past the initial statements. There are some things that I think I'm going to read a few quotes in, uh, here from that document. But there are some things that we've heard about quite a lot. So uh, this document that's issued by the central government, it's the product of uh, an agglomeration of interest, but specifically the Ministry of Science and Technology seems to have been the lead here, um, and which sets them apart to some extent from the Cyberspace Administration of China. It's a, and and uh, there's an element of competing centers of power within the Chinese government that we were analyzing as well. Um, but something that has been in a lot of the newspapers and a lot of the media has been uh, statements like this. AI has be become a new focus of international competition. AI is a strategic technology that will lead in the future. The world's major developed countries are taking the development of AI as a major strategy to enhance national competitive, competitiveness and protect national security. Um, you, they had these sort of eye-popping targets in the document. They say, by 2030, China's AI theories, technologies, and applications should achieve world-leading levels, making China the world's primary AI innovation center. So this is the thing that caught everybody's imagination. Um, the next layer down gets a bit more complicated, and, and this is something that we suffer from in the U.S. when we talk about AI policy as well. What do we mean here? So they, right in the, in the top, um, they give us a little summary of some of the areas uh, that they're talking about uh, at the government planning level when they're talking about AI. They're saying deep learning, uh, man-machine collaboration, swarm intelligence, autonomous control, uh, big data-driven cognitive learning, uh, man-machine collaboration, strengthened intelligence. Some of these words were a little tough to make concise. Uh, swarm integrated intelligence, uh, autonomous intelligence systems, uh, human-like intelligence. These are the types of things that they're actually specifying targets for. And uh, the document gets in some detail about what types of initiatives should be created over the next uh, 15 years or so to accomplish this world-leading uh, level. The sort of next layer that we thought was really interesting was that uh, China's perspective on AI development and planning uh, specifically addresses that there are going to be some risks, there are going to be some potential social, economic, security downsides. So they say, while vigorously developing AI, we must attach great importance to the potential safety risks and challenges, strengthen the forward-looking prevention and guidance on restraint, minimize risk, and ensure safe, reliable, and controllable development of AI. These are some of the things where you get into a push to get Chinese researchers and industry to lead in, in the world, while also a concern that the government would like to remain uh, able to successfully sort of supervise and control these things. It's a pretty serious dynamic that they're going to have to navigate as, as they uh, approach these concerns. As, as somebody who works at a law school, and I'll confess I'm not a lawyer, so um, I am interested nonetheless in uh, the ways that different governments and different organizations try to figure out how to regulate new areas. Here the United States is not really figuring out what to do yet. Uh, we have emerging risks from AI, we have emerging ethical problems. Um, at least at the planning level, the Chinese government is saying, uh, that there needs to be research on legal issues such as civil and criminal responsibility, uh, protection of privacy and property, information security, uh, traceability, accountability. Um, these are the types of things that are already programmed in. And so as part of this huge investment that's going to come with, with a lot of money and a lot of human resources, um, they're also specifying that they'd like to see uh, serious policy thinking, ethical thinking about how to manage AI going forward. I'll note a couple more things before we move on to the other stuff. There's absolutely plenty to get into. But um, it's not just about leading the AI industry. Uh, there is a common concern in how technology is used from the perspective of the Chinese government. Um, and they describe it specifically. They'd like to see 
both advances in industry and advances in governance. And from, from that perspective, governance means both uh, providing services to citizens, uh, providing citizens with confidence in governance, and you know, really improving government as would be recognized in any political system. At the same time, there's concerns about improving control and improving monitoring capabilities. And so the plan is, if it happens as planned, uh, that AI will be used to both improve the Chinese Communist Party ability to provide governance, public goods, and also to maintain control at the levels that they decide they'd like to. So it's, it's a mixed bag, and this is what you get when you go deeper into these documents. Um, the last thing I'll, notice, uh, I'll note, and, and I know that uh, uh, John is going to get a little bit into the, the national security level as well, but there's a specific note in this document in the, in the overall plan that there's a need for civil military integration. This is a larger concept um, in Chinese political thinking, but in the AI field, this means that if, it's, if civil uh, or you know, corporate developers are developing an AI technology, uh, there may be some interest in figuring out how to leverage that for military capabilities and other sort of hard national security interests. So um, I'll stop there, but the, you know, the, the message that we've come away with, and we're really excited to be doing these, these translations, uh, which occur across several different people, you know, we try to land on, a, on an agreed translation, even if not a totally undisputable one. Uh, we find that there's a lot of good material there, and we're going to keep putting it out over the next months and uh, look forward to following along with you. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. Um, and we're going to come back to sort of this AI and other technologies in due course. But uh, Sam, one of the, the areas that actually has had a fair amount of exposure in the Western media is, is the issue of uh, China's new cybersecurity law. Um, and that's in part because of people are concerned about the implications that has for the Western uh, private sector or pr private sector companies within the, the rest of the world. Um, however, it is not always clear that the, the message, the headlines that come out necessarily reflect the sort of nuances both within the law and, and, and the implementation of the law. So can you just give us a little bit of a feel for what the law says and what the ongoing discussions about how it is being implemented might tell us about where we're going to get to? cybersecurity law took effect in June, and the media headlines around this were, there's just a lot of uncertainty. We don't know anything. And I don't think that's true. I think we actually know a lot more about this law and about the broader legal framework that it's a part of. And that's where we get into the importance of Chinese sources um, and really taking close reads of those documents. So the first point I want to make um, is that this law um, is part of a rapid build-out of institutions, of policies, of regulations, of standards. There are dozens and dozens of pieces of this, which the leadership in China sees as the tools needed to carry out this vision of China as a superpower that Paul mentioned, right? So this is sort of, how are they actually going to do that? And in the past three years, we've seen a rapid expansion of this. The cybersecurity law itself, I think of as the centerpiece. Um, the keystone in the arch is a great description I've heard as well. Um, and what's happening here is you have the government recognizing that the growth and development of technology has really gotten ahead of their ability to regulate it, to control it. AI is a prime example of that, and Graham mentioned some of those dynamics between innovation and security. So that's what's driving this. Now, how do we think about the law itself and this broader framework? So as I said, the cybersecurity law is really a centerpiece, but it's not the only piece. In addition to the cybersecurity law, we're tracking dozens of different pieces of this legal system for cyberspace. So you have laws, you have the national security law, the counterterrorism law that all get at this element of governance in cyberspace. You also have a host of regulations, of measures and guidelines, which are meant to be read in reference to these laws and in many ways to expand on how China's policymakers are actually thinking about implementing their scope. Some of the most important of these, we've done a lot of analysis and translation of. Um, 
There is a measure related to securing critical information infrastructure, which my colleagues had an excellent post on um, over the summer. There are measures related to restrictions on cross-border data transmission. We just put out a piece on that on Friday. And then there are measures related to a new security review process for network products, products and services. Now those are just a few, but those are, I'd say, sort of the salient ones that we're really tracking. Um, in addition, you have dozens and dozens of standards that have come out by a body called TC260, which is subordinate to the Cyberspace Administration of China. And you know, these standards are not really standards in the way that we would think about a, an international standard. They're not descriptions of products. They're meant more to be um, explanations, again, clarifying the scope and implementation of some of these umbrella concepts that are issued as laws. Now we can get into, well, are the standards actually clarifying and narrowing the scope, or actually are they just as ambiguous and broad? And that's a whole separate topic. Um, in addition, you have a number of national level strategies, which are not actual laws or regulations, but they're sort of high level planning documents. So the National Informatization Plan, the 13 five year plan on informatization, Internet Plus. So I encourage you to think about the cybersecurity law as part of this broader cyber governance system, which is continuing to evolve and we're tracking it um, as we go. The third point that I want to make about the cybersecurity law is, you know, everyone is like, well, this is really uncertain and broad. We don't know what it means. So I've worked in industry. Um, I've seen for, from the ground level what some of this looks like in practical terms, and I think that's one of the big questions that a lot of people had about the law. Well, what, how does this impact operations for foreign companies, for domestic companies, for the media? Um, and just a few highlights from that. So, I'd say the most important practical implications for foreign companies, there are two. Um, one has to do with how data is controlled as it transit, transits across borders. There's a lot of internal debate on that, and I'd be happy to talk more in depth about that on the panel. Paul and Graham and I, as I said, just wrote a piece about this element of it. The second is about new security reviews for products, network products and services that are in China. Um, and the issue for foreign companies, and again, I've experienced this firsthand, is this sense that um, this is just a new area of regulatory uncertainty, where you have a new security review, and it's essentially a black box, right? We don't really know what that is going to consist of. We also know that there are other separate security reviews at other parts of the bureaucracy in China. So there's a concern that companies could kind of get caught in the crossfires of these different reviews at different levels of the bureaucracy, which could be used for as sort of a political whim. Um, the other area that I've seen is even before the cybersecurity law took effect in June, at least a year before this, foreign companies were voluntarily um, trying to demonstrate compliance with different elements of the cybersecurity law and the related measures and guidelines informally. So for example, going ahead and localizing their data in country, even before we know what the scope of that requirement is going to be. Submitting to voluntary security reviews, right? So there's definitely a level of informal ad hoc implementation apart from the actual um, release of some of these documents. The, the last point that I want to make about the practical implications are, let's not forget that this is not just aimed at foreign companies. So if we look at the enforcement actions that have been taken to date, they're all domestic companies. They're all about content regulation for domestic companies. And we're actually seeing a lot of internal debate specifically over how this is going to play out for China's national champions that are private sector, that are in the tech space, trying to expand overseas as part of this broader superpower vision under Xi Jinping. So with that, I'll stop. Um, and happy to talk more about any element of that as we get further on. And I think we'll particularly want to pick up that sort of intersection between government and tech uh, companies uh, going forward. But um, before we get there, um, Paul in his remarks uh, said, John, um, that there's this notion of without cybersecurity, there's no national security. Um, tell us, therefore, a little bit about um, how China thinks about its national security. Uh, and in particular, how its sort of national security establishment is, is, is having its impact on the digital economy and uh, tech issues in China. Right. I, I love talking about national, uh, you know, Chinese national security. It's the, the funnest topic up here, in my opinion. Um, 
But I mean, I, I really, I'll, I have to echo, echo a lot of what my sort of co-panelists have said. Uh, China has an expansive uh, view of national security that includes economic growth, state security, which is sort of internal control, and your sort of standard uh, Western notions of national security. Um, China sees promise, uh, China has problems of scale, both socially and economically, and sees information technology as a driver of growth, social management, and change, but with that comes very real risk of foreign influence. So it has a particularly difficult dilemma it has to square. How does it modernize without making itself even more vulnerable? And that's encapsulated in um, a statement uh, you know, Paul just said. Without modernization, there, uh, without informatization, there's no modernization. Without uh, cybersecurity, there is no national security. And I think it's not a coincidence that you see the Cyberspace Administration of China is the, the leading group that heads up that office is for both informatization and cybersecurity. That, that those are two equities that definitely need to be balanced. And so any discussion of Chinese national security in the cyber domain or informatization needs to be held in conjunction with, um, with the other. Um, and let's be clear, uh, you know, taken solely on its face, China has extreme vulnerabilities in the cyber domain. And they, they frequently discuss this. You know, the first point really is, is that uh, since Stuxnet in 2009, Arab Spring, um, the Snowden leaks, uh, uh, Mirai last year, WannaCry this year, China has seen a, a, a number of incidents, massive incidents that have shown um, the very real problems that could result if the internet or technology is not controlled. And uh, that's certainly validated their claims. How they've responded is, is uh, traditionally, is um, through massive, you know, uh, control, surveillance and control regimes. And what you see in the last few years is a new rule of law which seeks to provide a legal foundation for, um, for Chinese state security apparatus. But what, what, what I'm seeing differently in the last few years is what I'm calling techno-legal regimes. Um, you've seen legal measures and regulations that seek to make manifest the will of the Communist Party and the Chinese government in, in technology. But the major change for the last few years is they're seeking to do that at a technological level to make sure the technology cannot possibly um, you know, break, or if it does, that it's immediately identified and known. Um, second, I'd say, I'd say this, is that we, we have a tendency to talk about this in sort of a larger national security, international security concerns. China's worried about foreign governments. China's worried about um, foreign interference. China has a massive problem with crime and fraud that isn't often reported on. And uh, I, I, just to give you background, this isn't a plug, but my company, Flashpoint, we, you know, we do, uh, we look into deep and dark web communities. And every day I can see, you know, Chinese cyber criminals responding to the law. It is a massive issue China has with identity theft, with fraud. Um, I remember the, the series of Apache Struts exploits um, or vulnerabilities that have been released throughout this year. Within six hours, you've seen it weaponized into a POC on the Chinese deep and dark web and that no doubt pointed at Chinese websites. So let's not forget that China has over 700 million internet users and a rash of companies that are playing with technology that they may not understand, and they may not know how to, pr to protect or defend against. So let's be clear, taken on its face, China has a massive state security problem internally, not just uh, from um, what it considers to be its strategic adversaries. Finally, I take this point. Um, I think China's primary objective its grand strategy, if, if you, if, if, if it will. It is playing a chess game, in my opinion. I think its primary objective is to remove its king, it's the CCP and its government, beyond the rules of play, of normal play, using every element of state power. I don't think it's to defeat a foreign adversary. I don't think it sees it in that terms. I think it's in, in, to in, ensure that, the, that uh, social stability and uh, the Chinese government can maintain, regardless of any foreign influence. The problem that we have uh, in looking at that is, is it's developing levers to do so that could very easily be turned around for exerting influence outside of its own borders. That's problematic. Um, supporting national champions, having techno-legal regimes that have the potential to um, uh, disadvantage foreign companies in China um, in favor of uh, you know, domestic ones, building a strong military for defense building a, you know, a massive uh, national intelligence apparatus. All these are certainly for domestic control, and all these do shore up the information security of the, uh, of the, of the Chinese party state. But they're also very dual use. They could very easily be uh, leveraged against um, the international community. 
And I'm not saying that China's doing that, and I'm not saying that's the aim. But the potential for that is there. And I think it bears watching how that develops and how China intends to use it over the next few years. So John, we're going to come back to the international piece in a minute. But um, the obvious big event coming up uh, very soon is the Party Congress. And then we would be remiss if we didn't take the opportunity to say you know, what that means for this. And clearly, this isn't the key focus of what they're, they're looking at. But it, it can't help but have implications for the future digital economy. So um, China experts, what w should we be looking for from the Party Congress and the brouhaha around it um, that, that could have implications going forward for, for this area? Let, let, me, let me jump in there. So I think there's a couple of issues. One is sort of what, what's already happened before the Party Congress, and then what maybe may happen after the Party Congress. So prior to the Party Congress, of course, there's usually the, the requisite clampdown on social media and, and, and other, other uh, uh, it, it, uh, applications of concern. So for example, we've seen uh, in the last um, five or six months various efforts to to renew control over things like virtual private networks um, and, and also to control these applications such as WhatsApp, uh, Signal, some of the applications that are end-to-end encrypted, for example. So I think our, our assessment generally is that, that will, that, that's part of a longer-term trend. And in the run-up to a, something like a party congress, you're going to see, see uh, greater efforts to gain control over, the, over, over these types of um, emerging technologies. And so I think that trend will, will continue after the Party Congress, although I think um, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue because th there, there's not a desire, I think, in China to, cr to, to, to completely cut off things like virtual private networks because th uh, th these kinds of, of tools are used by in a, the part of the, uh, the startup community in China and, uh, part, part and, and help, in a sense, on the innovation front. And so I don't think there's a desire to, to, to completely clamp down. But I think after the Party Congress, we'll probably see um, some uh, potentially more regulation uh, and more, uh, you know, so, some sort of further legal structure for for um, for some of these applications. I think on the digital economy side, um, we recently seen, in the, uh, also in the run up to the Party Congress, uh, rumors in the in the media about things like the Chinese government taking stakes, small stakes in Chinese tech companies. I'm a little skeptical of um, of some of these rumors because I think there's already a lot of um, of, of, of ways for the government to, 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 to rein in some of, some, some of the, big, the bigger players like Alibaba and, and Tencent um, through other, other regulatory mechanisms. Um, some of those, those new digital economy industries are pushing into areas traditionally that are, that are the purview of, of, of other players in the Chinese system, like the People's Bank of China, which has already uh, last year started to, to take measures to, to require, for example, um, some kind of reserve for some of the electronic currency and the wallets that are, that are used in some of the mobile payment systems. So I think there's already a lot of effort um, to sort of, again, as, as the traditional media has been brought under, uh, as the online media has been brought under the controls of the traditional media, I think um, as, as, uh, as the digital economy has expanded, of course, uh, and I think as Sam mentioned, one of, the, one of the problems is that, and, and this is not just unique to China, is that the regulatory system is, is always sort of playing catch up on uh, on, on these things. So I think probably after the Party Congress, um, we've also made, the, made, the, made a call that things like the cybersecurity law and next steps in implementation in some of these key areas like the, the cybersecurity review, um, which are still many pieces of which are still not in place, probably after the Party Congress we'll see further progress in terms of s hopefully some clarity and in, in, in how some of the key provisions of the law will be implemented. Um, so the Party Congress sort of put a lot of things on hold um, on, on the one hand, and also led to some uh, further uh, uh, um, clamp down on, on certain um, uh, on things like social media. But I think after the Party Congress, there'll probably be movement. We've also got the World Internet Conference coming up in December, probably early December, which is one of those another one of those things that came out um, of of the of, of, of the, the Xi Jinping sort of effort to to to, um, to, to uh, unify the issues around digital economy and cybersecurity. Um, the fourth iteration will be held in, in December, and there may be some, some new initiatives that are, un, uh, that are unveiled there in terms of things like internet governance and some of the international aspects of the overall cyber strategy. So I think there's a lot, a lot of potential for, for things to happen after the Party Congress. Sarah. I wanted to add briefly yeah. to that um, a, a 
few weeks ago, I think there was reporting about extra clampdowns on um, online content and online chat groups in advance of the party congress. And one of the things that you know, we wrote about when that happened was, you know, yes, we, are see we saw a spate of new regulations come out related to real name registration online, online chat group owners suddenly are gonna be held responsible for that content. These are important pieces um, of regulation, but we didn't look at them as pegged to the party congress per se. If you look at those regulations, real name registration, for example, has been something that the Chinese government has been trying to do since at least 2009 in many different iterations. So it's not like this is something that's just going to intensify leading up to uh, this month and then we're gonna sort of see it go on the back burner. That's not how we read that. We see this as part of a much broader um, effort to build out these cyber governance mechanisms that we've been talking about. And so seeing the party Congress as like the sort of the crux of it, I think is a false flag. John. Um, so I, I, this is less to do with the party Congress than I say the, the sort of the next challenge China has to square in support of supporting cyber, uh, cyber security and digital economy efforts. Um, the next sort of five years, China needs to figure out how to um, have its national security and state security apparatus engage with industry in a productive way um, for information sharing, for IOCs, for cybersecurity. And that's certainly something the United States has challenges, uh, certainly has challenges with. I can tell you this, the way sort of power is managed amongst uh, Chinese uh, state security is, is very divisive, it's very siloed. Um, I mean, you have sort of five dragons in sort of Chinese cybersecurity, the CAC, Ministry of in uh, Industry and Information Technology. So the CAC is done? Uh, Cyberspace Administration of China, Mi uh, Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, Ministry of Public Security, Ministry of State Security, and the PLA. Uh, each of those don't play nice with each other. Um, so each of those has a specific role to play in cybersecurity. The question over the next five years, and I think a question that, that will certainly be helped answer to the National Party Congress, is um, how China is, how the Communist Party is going to have those sort of five actors play together in cybersecurity in a way that benefits um, companies. Um, I think that's going to be difficult. Um, since 2012, you know, cybersecurity has been sort of the imprimatur of Xi Jinping, and I think the next step there is is to solve some of the bureaucratic issues at the top um, for cybersecurity. So, so the, the other area that I think we're going to, uh, another area I should say, that we're going to have um, develop over the next five years, Paul references, John did as well, is the way in which China engages on the international stage uh, in terms of what we have previously called internet governance, but we now might think of sort of global governance in the digital era. Um, what, what sort of uh, sense do we have of how the Chinese are beginning to think about uh, these issues? And you know, we, we saw the effective collapse of the group of governmental experts at the UN, which may provide opportunities for, for states to come up with other ideas. W w where do we think the direction is in terms of Chinese thinking on, on the international stage? Um, well, I'll give this a, a shot. I, I think uh, it's nice that I didn't have to answer the 19th Party Congress question <laughs> because my approach to predicting this particular future has been to stay out of it. Um, but there are a few things to watch for as this emerges, and um, one of them is precisely this question. So in, along with the, uh, these major party congresses, there are the release of long, uh, pretty vague documents. But you can analyze from point to point whether the documents uh, say something new or different about whatever your domain of interest is. And in this case, um, we've seen hints in, uh, in some of the commentaries that have been put out there uh, that there is a desire to uh, move forward in international cybersecurity cooperation. So there's a, uh, earlier this year, I think, or, or late last year, sometimes I get confused, there was the, uh, a, an official Chinese strategy for uh, international cooperation in cyberspace. Um, this document, you know, included, there was a lot in there, but one of the things that it uh, pushed was that there, you know, there is a sort of common insecurity that states face when it, when it comes to, uh, you know, cybercrime or non-state actors or other things that sort of, uh, even states that may be rivals in one field may also have common uh, security risks. And so I think that um, in a number of commentaries, a number of, number of forums, there's, there's a hint that 
uh, China's government may want to push forward some uh, common security approach on the international stage in a way that is sort of distinct from the UN group of governmental experts that uh, unfortunately was not able to come to an agreement. In, in that context, the discussion was about which norms could be sort of tentatively agreed among a number of states uh, for state conduct in cyberspace. Um, in, in this potential new space that we can watch for, it's what concretely can be done among governments uh, to either jointly identify or jointly combat various uh, cyber threats. So that's something that may be out there. Then again, it may not be. So we'll, we'll just be watching. Uh, at least that'll be what I'll do. And other people may have views on that, but sort of to, to feed into that sort of uh, question about sort of Chinese approach to the, the international uh, dimension, w w what do we see as their response to recent sort of global cyber um, incidents, particularly sort of ransomware attacks and others, and, and how, how does that feed into these uh, conversations about governance and I think, um, just to expand a little bit on Graham, uh, so they came out with this, um, this international strategy for, uh, for uh, cyber cooperation in March, which had an action plan. But now this, this was all before the, the WannaCry and, uh, and not Petya viruses hit. I, I think my sense is that they were hit much harder by WannaCry than may have been reported or, uh, or acknowledged um, in, in the media. This is what I've heard from several people. Um, so I think there's a belief, maybe a growing belief in the Chinese system that, 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 that there's, a, there's an opportunity here given the likely continued threat of, um, of similar types of, of, of unpredictable global outbreaks of ransomware and other malware um, given the, the amount of really sophisticated malware that's out there now for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I think they may believe that this is a time to take the next step, for example, from the GGE uh, and, and push for something uh, at, at the global level in terms of things like, like sharing cyber threat intelligence at some level on things like ransomware attacks. So, um, but this is a very difficult issue that, uh, that would involve um, building uh, support within the UN um, and, and certainly would have to have the uh, support of major players like the US and Eastern and West and uh, uh, Europe, the, Europe, the EU. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest in this within the Chinese system. How this will come out um, in a terms of a concrete proposal, I think, remains to be seen. But I think um, the, if we, at the next time, if, if t we wake up tomorrow and there's another massive ransomware attack globally, then this will give, this will give even more impetus to, uh, to the Chinese to, to, to argue that um, the time has come for some sort of uh, minimal uh, level of sharing of, of uh, globally. Because I think they were also, I heard that they were, they were, they were concerned in the WannaCry, uh, during the WannaCry attack, that there wasn't enough cooperation, like cert to cert, there wasn't enough exchange of information on, on that threat. Anyone else? Uh, was the question like what we can, was it, is it good, hello? Um, was the question what we can expect from China internationally? Yes, and particularly whether kind of recent events uh, yeah. kind of changed that. Um, I would say sort of two things. Uh, it, was, it was in a dialogue not too long ago and had to sort of bring this up, and it's sort of uncomfortable talking about with the Chinese. But one is, uh, you know, we need to recognize where there are asymmetries between the United States and China in cyberspace. That seems like an obvious thing. But there, there are two sort of fundamental ones. One is how we define cybersecurity. Um, you know, China has a much more expansive definition of, of what a cyber threat is that includes uh, anything that, you know, could indu you know, disrupt social stability or, um, or sort of, uh, sort of negative feeling, generate negative feeling. Um, I, I think what we're going to see, and you saw this in the international cooperation in cyberspace, you're going to see China, you know, pursue a consensus approach to try to find uh, other states with whom they have that sort of same a, uh, sort of asymmetri asymmetrical uh, view of, uh, of cybersecurity and uh, uh, perhaps approach something in the, uh, the UN in the next few years. The second one is sort of harder, harder to define. Second asymmetry is that Chinese, China's, despite Despite um, you know the frequent APT reporting, wow, it's like what 20 minutes, and this is the first time I mentioned Chinese APT. Um, I should just say that's advanced persistent. Threat. Advanced persistent threat. Yeah. So I, I would say this is that you know China at least defines itself as having a, a, a immature um, cyber defense, and by I mean cyber national defense capability, um, and 
you know, China defying cybersecurity threat expansive, it, it will not change, but Chinese uh, views on their relative maturity uh, to the United States, uh, Russia, and, you know, the Five Eyes countries on, um, on cyber capabilities is likely to change in the next five years. I think one of the things we need to watch is, is uh, China's evolving approach to norms. I think China is going to want some sort of, you know, to have some level, you know, give itself some space to grow, but without, uh, um, and, you know, cyber norms could run, run counter to that. So well, I think you'll see sort of uh, cooperation, especially law enforcement cooperation or something approaching um, understanding like sort of, you know, online anti-terrorism um, at a uh, UN level when it comes to like sort of international cyber norms and law of armed conflict. I don't think that's likely to be viable in the next few years. So I'm going to open this to the floor fairly soon, but I, two quick questions I want to cover. Um, first one is, um, we heard from Graham about the new AI technology. Um, we've spoken understandably about sort of cybersecurity. What are the other areas of technology that um, are, we should be tracking in terms of what China's doing, what's interesting, and therefore how they will be thinking about? Um, I think cryptocurrencies is interesting, quantum, what's, right. What, what, what's out there that, as we take this DigiGina blog forward, we're going to be trying to track? I'd add to that list the internet economy, which can be divided into a lot of different subsectors. So that includes fintech, it includes e-commerce, it includes ride sharing um, and logistics over the internet, um, as well as sort of social media platforms. You know, I've, I've, I've spoke with a number of folks that are on the ground in China actively investing in internet startups, and they say that the internet sector in China, not, we're not talking the big Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, we're talking the emerging players at some of the most innovative, dynamic, creative work that they've seen, and it's a pretty exciting space. I would just add, um, I think, and we, we mentioned this briefly in, uh, in, in one of the translations we did related to cross-border data flows. I think one of the issues that um, is critical, that, that Beijing sees as critical in getting the cross-border data flows piece right is, is look, they're, looking, they're looking ahead at eventually um, a, a, a situation where, where almost everything is in the cloud. Uh, cloud services are par paramount, and, and smart cities are a big piece of that. So I think, I think it's important to sort of look, I think they sort of, the, in my mind, they're, they're looking at the end, the, not the end game, but at least one st key state is gonna be when, when uh, I think they have 95 smart city initiatives now, so almost every, they can, uh, you know, and Xi Jinping is building a new, a new um, smart city in Xiong'an, which is south of Beijing. And so I think they're viewing this as they want to get, one of the reasons for the cybersecurity law, AI plays into all this, is that one of the, the key, key places, that, and that's also going to be one of competition with foreign companies, is the cloud. And how, how, who manages the cloud? How is data secured in the cloud? And how, how is privacy maintained in the cloud? These are really key issues. I think part of the, the way to view some of these initiatives, and particularly cybersecurity law, is, is an attempt to get ahead of that eventuality when you're going to have critical infrastructure, being uh, key applications being run from the cloud, uh, and how is that going to be secured? How is data going to flow back and forth uh, that, that's going to be a potential national security uh, with na national security implications? And so I think um, the, 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 one of the key applications is, is smart cities, and, and, and in many manifestations, particularly things like uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, that's going to be a big, a big, a big uh, area where China is already uh, trying to get ahead from a regulatory po point of view, try to think, of, th think through a lot of the issues related to connected vehicles, um, and, and, and looking, at, looking at examples from the EU and other places. So I think um, that's sort of, uh, in three, three to four years, when we have a fifth generation cellular networks deployed, uh, and we have a, a tremendous more movement into the cloud, um, it's going to be a really different world, I think, and I think, I think part of the regulatory game is to try to get ahead of that. There's a concept also from the Kyosher article that, that we translated. Not just there is no national security without cybersecurity, but there's no informatization without cybersecurity. So it's this idea that cybersecurity as seen, is seen as an enabler of digitalization and that you can't really capture the benefits of digitalization without that security piece. I'll, I just want to put a plug in for something that's on the margins of the, uh, the sort of digital realm, but I think is increasingly going to be relevant, and we see it also in the AI plan, um, is biological science and technology. Um, uh, genetic sequencing technology is, is a major uh, area of development. 
uh, in, in, in China, there are some global leading corporations that are working in this area. They're building data stores, uh, national genetic data uh, storage databases that are going to be consequential and they're going to be merged with uh, machine learning and other sort of digital technologies uh, in a way that brings the uh, digital policy and digital economy concern uh, directly into the sort of human biological and of course agricultural uh, biological fields. So uh, I'm going to be watching that. I, I, I think I've got a lot to learn in that area. I don't know about you. John. Uh, I, I think the, one of the larger points, and I think all of us up here agree on this, is that uh, China's arrived as, a, as an innovation powerhouse and uh, that uh, the U.S. and countries around the globe need to come to term with, terms with that. There is some sort of skepticism that needs to come around anytime China, Chinese scientists make a, make a sort of an outlandish claim. But I can tell you this pretty consistently, those are validated. Um, Chinese, the Chinese government and Chinese companies and Chinese venture capitalists are making big bets and uh, very much in the hope that they're paying off. One that is sort of a pet project of mine is, uh, is quantum. Um, China has launched uh, you know, world's first quantum satellite. They've installed the, uh, the world's first nationwide quantum uh, fiber network. And I can tell you this, uh, there's no real, real chance, there's no, no one knows if it's really going to work as it intends, but it is a massive bet that the Chinese government's making with nearly unlimited funding. Um, but I would say, look at it, um, you know, there's the bet itself, and then there's a secondary thing, which is, you know, the secondary beneficiaries of this are often uh, scientists, postdocs, and small companies that get, you know, government funding that get to start a business or get to do basic research. And that basic research, it's, you never know what, where, where that's gonna come in, uh, sort of, um, you never know where that's gonna lead. And uh, so I think the secondary thing we need to look at when it comes to sort of these major innovation pushes is that down the line, there's you know, sort of downstream beneficiaries in basic research, basic funding for applied research that could have unforeseen benefits, uh, both Chinese innovation and um, Chinese economy and Chinese military competitiveness in the future. So last question from me. Um, one of the things as we take this blog forward that we've all agreed we want to do is, is not necessarily just to think of this in um, bilateral terms. And, and we're very excited to be working with uh, University of Leiden in the Netherlands, which um, helps remind us that there's a, a big European dimension to, to the, the relationship with to China, or to, to, um, Chinese engagement uh, in, the, in the international sphere. Um, that said, as we sit here in Washington, D.C., um, and, and look across to Beijing, um, it's, it's difficult not to think of you know, what this means for, for the bilateral relationship. Graham, you do a newsletter about sort of U.S.-China. Um, what, what do you think these developments in the digital economy mean for the way in which um, the U.S. engages with China and, and more broadly sort of U.S., the U.S. economy engages with the Chinese economy? Uh, well, I mean, briefly, I think it's the digital economy issues are at the center of the development of U.S.-China relations right now. We have uh, a administration that is focusing a lot of the discussion uh, about China policy and bilaterally with China on economic trade and investment issues. Um, they're focusing that discussion further on uh, things like intellectual property and technology. Uh, and there's the 301 investigation uh, at the U.S. Trade Representative that, uh, you know, is likely to find that China has violated some of the... A 301 investigation is what in... It's, uh, you know, don't, don't try to get me too, too much of an expert on trade law, but it's a, a special investigation, and maybe others can say more if necessary, but it's an investigation that uh, looks at whether uh, another country has engaged in practices that violate uh, U.S. Uh, expectations, and it's a, also a set of tools that comes before uh, the WTO regi regime solidified. And so if there's a finding that China has violated U.S. Uh, expectations, in my understanding, it's possible the U.S. would come back with responses that would be inconsistent with the WTO. Now, they'd also be free to respond in a way that is consistent with the WTO. And this has uh, thrown quite a, a, a sort of wild card into the bilateral conversation uh, because the investigation itself is essentially a threat to China that over these intellectual property issues, uh, the U.S. government may be willing to uh, 
you know, sort of seriously jeopardize the international trade regime globally. So, uh, you know, anyway, not to, not to escalate too far into that, but I, I do think it is fairly central. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is that in this, there's a sense of unfair competition that has set in among American businesses and business groups. Um, there's also a cliche that uh, has the benefit of being fairly insightful, I think, that trade and investment had been the ballast of US-China relations, keeping the ship stable as it sailed through uh, problems uh, having to do with national security or human rights conflicts or other you know, geopolitical issues. Um, the business community is no longer so uh, speaking with one voice uh, in favor of stable overall relations with China. And I think it uh, is closely related to these high-tech areas in general and, and digital in specific. So um, yeah, it's wrapped up quite closely. OK, we started five minutes late, so we're going to go five minutes over if, uh, uh, if we may. And that gives about 25 minutes to get some questions from from you in the audience, and indeed, if anyone online wants to tweet a question, uh, feel free, and uh, we'll try and get it asked. Um, questions for the panel. Um, uh, what would you like to hear from them? To the back, yes, please. Please wait for the microphone for the benefit of people online. And please uh, state who you are, where you're from, and uh, end your question with a question mark. Um, Nicole Janae from Standard Chartered Bank, and my question is actually about the intellectual property piece that you just discussed. There was a long period of time where China was sort of the poster child for intrusions, specifically for the purpose of intellectual property theft, and then the, the intrusions dropped off and it was attributed to the agreement between the Obama administration and the Chinese government that they would no longer engage in destructive practices against each other. I'm wondering if that is the only reason why we've seen this drop off or if it's possible that because of all the developments in the Chinese technology that they've actually reached a point where there's diminishing returns uh, for those types of intrusions and it's no longer really worth the, the effort. John? Uh, th there's, two, there's two things. I think there has been diminishing uh, returns when it comes to uh, what Chinese are able to get and sort of operationalize. When you look at sort of emerging innovation, innovative technologies such as AI or quantum, uh, stealing trade secrets doesn't really convey uh, an, an advantage. And some of the most pressing problems China has, uh, such as issues with engine design, or it's using engine manufacturing and metallurgy, uh, stealing trade secrets, again, is not going to give you a, a massive advantage. Um, I'd say that's number one. Number two is that the Chinese military wasn't good at it. Um, they, they were able to steal some stuff with smash and grab tactics, but I mean, one thing that you're seeing is you're seeing the Ministry of State Security take over that mission, um, mo mostly because they're reliable, but uh, the Chinese military's efforts to steal intellectual property was hopelessly compromised by sheer fact that they kept on getting caught and they became a political liability. That's number one. Number two is China needs them to actually fulfill the mission of cyber national defense. So you've seen massive restructuring over the last few years, largely the focus of uh, having, of, you know, Bridging the gap between where China's military is and where it needs it to be for the cyber domain, that means making it focus on issues of actual hard national security. Um, from, from my friends at FireEye and CrowdStrike, I think, um, from what I recall, have shown that the drop in military-related APT actually started before the Xi-Obama agreement, but certainly accelerated afterwards. I'll say this as a final note. Any um, notions that anything other, anyone other than the Communist Party was controlling Chinese APT should be assuaged after the Xi-Obama agreement. Xi, uh, Xi Jinping said, you know, we will do no more you know, hacking for economic espionage, and there was a drop in APT. That right there is a foundation of accountability and expectation that Chinese controls their, uh, their, uh, their cyber forces, and we should hold them to it. I just want to add one thing that in the scope of that agreement, that bilateral sort of parallel statements that were made, um, the promise was to not conduct or knowingly support uh, stealing of secrets for the purpose of uh, commercial, commercial competition. Yeah. Um, it left on the, you know, if you wanted to steal secrets from Boeing or something, this was still uh, free game. And if the United States wanted to steal secrets from a national security uh, 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 crucial Chinese entity. It was also not something that they swore not to do. So anyway, I, I think that's a 
it's, there's a bit of a weasel word in there that's good to keep in mind as we think about the effect. And so you can ask questions about the motivation for that, but does, does that, the very fact of um, this sort of drop off in uh, activity, at least in sort of the, the economic area, suggest that China may be susceptible to a norms-based approach, at least when it suits them? And th does that have implications for how we think about engaging them on some, some wider issues? The answer could be no, of course. I, 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 I'm not sure. I think the myth of the Chinese monolith in cyber was, was so, so persistent and so strong for so long that it's weird to say that we helped create a monolith now that we can pressure. But whether that's sort of, um, um, you know, will bear dividends in the future is difficult. We do have more room in the cyber relationship because we sort of dropped the internet freedom agenda and the Chinese, the Chinese APT issue is, is at least dormant for now. So there is a lot more room there um, in dealing with China on cyber, uh, cyber issues. Rebecca. Hi, my name is Rebecca McKinnon. Um, very interesting panel. I have one question about uh, Chinese companies and sort of the alignment of their interests with the Chinese government. Um, to what, I mean, at the moment, the, their interests are largely aligned, which is sort of keeping things on a track, but you're seeing the government, you know, taking shares in, in Chinese internet companies or claiming that it plans to. Um, I, I guess one question is, to what extent do you expect that the interests of Chinese companies and the government will remain largely aligned? And in what ways do you think there's potential for um, less alignment or in what areas, uh, what types of companies and, and what types of implications do you think that has? To what extent do you think the Chinese government is able to sort of assert alignment um, in different ways? I'm, I'm just sort of curious about your perspectives looking forward. Great question. Who wants to jump in? So, uh, okay. No, 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 you, you, you. you. No, you go. Okay. Sam first, I'll jump in. Okay, okay. Um, I mentioned Please. before the issue of cross-border data flows, and I think this is a great case study in understanding some of these dynamics between the government and some of the tech companies in China. Um, we put out a piece last week I mentioned, there's a lot of internal disagreement about this issue that we felt was actually not part of the public conversation and we wanted to get out there. This is an area of China's cybersecurity law where we actually have seen a lot of pushback from uh, domestic industry in China, um, where it's, it's pretty clear that if you want um, global globally competitive uh, Chinese brands that have access to, to markets outside of China, they're going to have to um, engage in cross-border data transfers, and they can't do that in a regime that is very restrictive of that. So that's an area where there has definitely been some give and take between government and industry. You know, I think that this is an area where you know, Jack Ma once described his relationship with Beijing as saying, well, just because you love someone doesn't mean you should marry them, right? And I think that there's no doubt that there's a, a very close relationship um, but it's not, it may not be as monolithic as I think some would suspect. You know, Paul, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, great question. I think um, we've been wrestling with this. I'm very interested in this, uh, in this issue going forward. I think, because I think we're at this critical point where these companies like Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent in particular, and also some of the Chinese telecom companies and some of the smaller players are all interested in being global players. So. Um, and at the same time, China is, in, is, is putting in place this, this very interesting regime on the cyber side, including things like data. So to get, just expand a little bit on, um, on Sam's point. So for example, uh, Chinese companies like Alibaba are opening data centers now in Europe uh, and other countries. So, and, but primarily a lot of what they're doing right now is servicing Chinese tourists and other, other, other people. But, uh, and other Chinese uh, uh, visitors. But if they're going to actually, for example, be servicing EU clients, then presumably they're going to they're have to fall under the EU uh, general data protection regulation, which goes in place next year. And so in my mind, it's still a big, uh, an open question mark as to how does that, how does that happen? Because under the GDPR, uh, the EU will recognize other countries as having adequate protections for things like you know, data privacy, uh, data protection. Um, but in the case of, of China, I don't think anybody would, would assert that, that the EU, for example, would, 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 uh, would 
uh, rate China as, as adequate in terms of protecting, protecting data. The question is, could a company like Alibaba gain that kind of, um, gain that kind of um, certification? I know that when I ask people, well, does Alibaba have to comply with GDPR? The question is, well, of course. But I don't know in terms of actual practice how that's actually gonna, gonna happen. Um, on the issue of ownership, again, as I said uh, uh, earlier, I'm a little skeptical that the Chinese government is going to insist on shares and, and board representation uh, on all of the tech companies. I think so far it's been a couple of small media companies, primarily content companies, where there has been some sense, that I think the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, the CAC actually held some shares in a small company, EDN, I think was the company. Uh, but uh, I, I just, I, I, as I said before, I don't, I don't see this as, um, uh, as, as, as an approach that, that, will, that, that seems promising in terms, because there's many, there, there first there are many other ways for the, for the government to assert control over, over, over companies. I think this would really complicate too their ability to go globally and be treated as essentially private sector companies. If they're going to be viewed as essentially um, uh, having um, government, some government shares and representation on the board. So, um, and this is a big issue now with, with, for issues like CFIUS, where the, we, which we haven't even touched on today. But again, as part of the, the broader US, China, and, the e, and also the EU comes in here, um, there's, a, there's a big move to restrict or at least review uh, foreign investment uh, in the US and in the EU in, in these high technology sectors. And um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the many criterion is, is uh, the, the is foreign ownership of, of the company. So for example, Alibaba has already has a CFIUS case, uh, before, a case before CFIUS with MoneyGram. And so now if suddenly the Chinese government has a 1% has a, has a, has a or a 5% stake in Alibaba, um, you know, that, that's obviously what would complicate that calculation. So I, I don't see it um, as that, 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 that um, method of, of, of holding stakes and, and having representation necessarily as, as something that in the long run is going to may, may be viable. Now maybe after the party congress uh, we'll see some movement on that, but I think a lot of it has been, has been sort of in the rumor mill. I'll just say re really quickly uh, that the example of the Alibaba-affiliated Alibaba Ant Financial and MoneyGram uh, transaction mm -hmm. uh, that I believe is still under review, it's a demonstration of the government interest in designing uh, data protection principles that give the government great access, uh, already at, in conflict with the corporate interests of the potential Chinese acquirer. If those regulations or practices were different on the Chinese side, then the prospects for that transaction would be a lot greater than they are. And I would just add that this has significant implications as well for how we're thinking in the US about our approach to things like the cybersecurity law, right? Like the fact that there is more of a nuance and more of an internal debate in China matters. Because right now, those voices are very much alive and thriving in China and saying, hey, look, let's maybe narrow the scope of what we're talking about here. I would argue that if we are too confrontational with China on this stuff, if we push them too hard, if we get into a cycle of retaliation from a trade perspective, those voices within China maybe lose some influence. And so it's not in our benefit to corner China on this issue. And so just to be a bit more explicit, do, uh, do you see those voices from the tech companies, or do you see them from, from within the government as well? Both. Okay. Both. Question over there at the back. Hi, Kath Cummins from the Global Network Initiative. I've got another question about companies, only this time US companies, or perhaps I should say foreign companies in China. What leverage do those companies have or have not um, as this whole uh, sort of labyrinth of laws starts rolling out? And to what extent do they have any impact on how local companies are going to be regulated as well? Dan, that's probably yours to start. You know, I think, and this is true today, and it was true five years ago, I think to the extent that global companies have something innovative and new to bring to the China market, that's going to continue to create space for operations, even as the regulatory uncertainty and costs of doing business there increase. Um, it's always been the case that market demand is really important. Um, not to say, but now I think we're in an environment where that's becoming much more difficult. Um, Sorry, did I answer the full extent of the question? Or I can say. Yeah. I can jump in on that. I should probably be a bit more specific. Yeah. I, when I say leverage, I guess I'm talking about um, 
you know, the, the much vaunted internet freedom agenda, which I think, I forget who just said, was just recently dumped. Um, is that something that, um, is there leverage there on, on some of those agenda items, do you think? I don't, I don't understand, uh, I don't understand what you're asking. If you could rephrase, I'm sorry. I'll try again. Um, so privacy and freedom of expression are two of the issues in uh, the broader internet freedom agenda. I'm curious the role that foreign companies may or may not have in making sure that freedom of expression and privacy and other global norms have a chance to uh, grow or be included in the Chinese internet space. So I, I have a partial thought on that, and, and it is that, I mean, I, I try to watch the GNI fairly closely I mean, from, since it was started, and I sort of keep asking myself, are the companies trying, right? So it's, it's two questions. Do they have the leverage, and, and are they trying to do it? And I think sometimes yes and sometimes not. Uh, and as you know better than anyone, the, the companies are very different in their approach. Um, I think, though, that there is a there are areas where there are uh, alignments between elements of the bureaucracy and civil society in China that uh, coincide with interests of some of the companies. And I think that that can exist to some extent in the privacy space. I think um, Chinese internet users are increasingly conscious at least of the sort of cyber crime related uh, risks to privacy or you know, so being exposed or having your financial data um, uh, messed with. Um, these are risks that are becoming more salient. Of course, in the Chinese context, uh, there's you know, privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government and then there's privacy vis-a-vis -vis the companies or other sort of things. So I, I think there are, you know, you, you, I would not expect that there's a heck of a lot of leverage on privacy vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese government, especially for Chinese users in China. I mean, that's gonna be a heavy lift and I wouldn't imagine people are gonna be very successful. However, if companies, uh, and this can be foreign and domestic companies, uh, want to work on securing the data, being more ethical in the way it's used in big data and AI, machine learning, et cetera, applications, I think there are real improvements that can be made. Uh, it just might demand a somewhat pragmatic uh, division of, of likely attainable outcomes. I, oh, sorry. We'll come back to you, John, but I want to get a few more questions in. Um, let's be fair and come over to this side. We'll come back. Hi, I'm uh, Christy, I'm from uh, iDefense. Uh, we're a threat intelligence research company. Um, and I was wondering if, what, guy, uh, what you guys had in terms of a perspective on how you see uh, China's long-term uh, foreign intelligence collection objectives and capabilities changing over time. I know that's a very, that's a very difficult one, but um, I mean, as you're saying, like from uh, the the degree of commercially motivated IP theft has obviously fallen off massively, and we're starting to see um, much more of a targeted focus for uh, Russia, uh, sorry, Chinese APT activity. But there's also the possibility that as China um, expands its kind of footprint internationally in terms of uh, um, interconnectedness with um, global telecommunications, that they have the chance to to scale up that capability quite significantly if they essentially want to go for an NSA type capability in the future. So how do you see that changing over time and whether there's anything in the, in the Pi conference discussion that's likely to shape that? So we could do a whole panel on this and indeed in due course we will. Uh, but John, do you want to Real just quick. very quickly? We're already seeing them. Um, uh, to be honest with you, Chinese, you got to understand Chinese intelligence primarily comes from human intelligence, which is difficult to scale and is very federated and very compartmentalized. China needs to do the exact opposite with what uh, their, their uh, cyber surveillance uh, mechanisms. And you're starting to see that. A few years ago, the Ministry of State Security started to pivot um, from targeting you know, onesies and twosies users to actually targeting things at scale. You saw that with the OPM hack. You saw that with targeting Chinese uh, managed service providers earlier this year. You saw it with supply chain attacks. What, uh, what appears what China's Ministry of State Security is trying to do is collect the haystack to start to be able to build a global intelligence capability at scale. That's in fulfillment of their foreign intelligence mission. Um, the next step here is intelligence reform. They still have um, you know, separate parallel missions between the military and civilian side that uh, neither need to be coordinated or completely divorced from one another to ensure they don't trip over each other's feet. 
Thank you. Uh, one more, oh, sorry, there are two more hands up, so we'll take both questions together, if I may. So, um, um, so the gentleman with the glasses, uh, and then the gentleman standing up, and we'll take both questions together, if you may. Thank you. I have a very specific question, and I hope somebody can comment on it. I work with a number of Israeli startups, specifically in the cyberspace, and increasingly, especially with some of the, some of the younger companies looking for capital, there's a question. There's lots of Chinese private equity in Israel right now. There has been for a few years. They've bought all kinds of crazy things like the national dairy. Um, the question is, your views on the real or the perceived issue that if an Israeli company takes Chinese capital, it limits its ability to work in the U.S. market, and more specifically, the U.S. government. And sorry, the gentleman with the uh, lanyard. Hello, my name is Chuck Napar. I'm from Ajaxic Cyber Enterprises. And my question is, does China util utilize NIST? And where do you see the future of NIST with innovation? That's a great question. Two questions, jump in. So two questions. Um, one, yeah. views on um, Chinese VCs. And the second question was, does um, China use the NIST framework? And, or, and, and maybe to cast that a little widely, do we have a sense of, of, of what sort of standards and frameworks that they are using for their cybersecurity? So, at the risk of overstepping my level of knowledge about the CFIUS process in the United States, I think it's, you can generally say that a company having some Chinese investment around the world isn't necessarily going to immediately encounter trouble uh, making investments or doing business with the U.S. under the existing uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. framework. Um, that framework as it stands now is designed to assess uh, usually uh, majority stake or total a acquisition, uh, you know, controlling stake, you, should, you could say, um, transactions uh, for real national security priorities. And, and in the case of a national dairy, I think that's what you said, um, you know, the, there was congressional push to review the major transaction where a Chinese firm bought Smithfield ham. Uh, and, you know, there were people making arguments that this is America's food security and this and that. And anyway, the committee decided that after all, this wasn't a national security threat. So that's the current regime. It'd be another story to get into what might happen to CFIUS in the future. But for now, um, the, the mere fact of invest, uh, Chinese investment, I don't think, is a major risk factor. Well, I would just add to that, though, that um, under legislation that will likely be proposed soon in Congress by Senator Cornyn, um, there is an attempt to expand some of the the things that would kick off a CFIUS investigation. So that could include minority investments and minority stakes in companies. Um, so that's gonna, there's going to be a vigorous debate about that, and there already is within uh, the, the Treasury Department and others about, about how, what, what, because there's, there's a reluctance to mess with the, uh, the underlying legislation, but there could be, over the next number of months, an attempt to expand that, which could uh, cast new light on, um, on investments, and particularly in high-tech sectors. I think the concern is, are things like AI, um, semiconductors, um, you know, robotics, and, and automation, those kinds of things. And the last question before I wrap up is, um, do we have a sense of what the Chinese themselves are using as the, the framework for their, their own cybersecurity regime? Well, I know recently they, um, in measures put out by uh, Ministry of uh, Industry and Information Technology earlier this year, they called for a sort of national um, sort of cyber threats database, and they uh, very specifically, you know, at least directed, you know, subordinate organs to come up with, and, you know, standards for IOCs uh, and information sharing. Um, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that, whether they use NIST as a framework. I'd, I'm, I'm sure they might borrow some concepts from it, but uh, um, that I don't know. So just before we wrap up, um, I'm going to ask the panelists to tell me, um, I'll tell you, in fact, uh, what they're working on and um, what they think we should be looking forward as we um, develop this Digital China blog. We look into the future of sort of Chinese digital economy. Um, what, what have you guys got in store for, for the people who have been uh, listening to us today? We'll, we'll, we can go down. Paul. Cool. Um, I'm particularly interested in, um, in the digital Silk Road. Because uh, one thing we haven't mentioned uh, yet today is One Belt, One Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think um, there's a lot of hype about that, a lot of confusion. And so one of the things I'm trying to, trying to get, wrap my head around is 
what, uh, what really is the digital Silk Road and how will that play out in the next um, particularly two years. It'll probably come up at the, at the WIC in, the, in December. There was a pa big panel on it last year, which was essentially a Chinese company saying whatever we're doing along these countries is sort of one belt, one road. Um, uh, but I think, I think um, there's been a lot in the, in the media recently about uh, data centers, Huawei and other companies wanting to build data centers along countries along the one belt, one road. So I think that's, that's going to be a big growth area in the next two, uh, one to two years. Grant? Um, there's going to be a lot to look at, but one thing already on our radar is there is a, uh, is it a draft or full standard out on personal data protection. And this is, these standards sit uh, at a level uh, separate from more explicitly binding measures and laws, uh, but they have force as adopted by various uh, organizations and enforcement measures. Um, and so we're going to be looking at what and how uh, personal data protection is framed, what it means in terms of uh, comparing with international norms of privacy. Um, and this also meshes quite happily with the mandate that is in their AI national plan to think through the privacy implications of AI. And, and that's something that's just a little bit further down the road um, as, as we look at all the materials. I'm also really interested in this evolving data protection regime in China and how China is approaching it, particularly given all of the internal debate that we see around this issue. Um, I'm also working on a big study which will release in early January, assessing innovation in China's internet sector specifically. Um, are these companies able to be competitive and, inter and innovative globally is sort of the next big question. And last word, Sean. So um, two things I'm going to concentrate on in the next few years is, uh, is crime. Um, not me doing it, but uh, just <laughs> You have to raise money somehow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's D.C., the cost of living. No, um, Chinese, like, we, we talk about, you know, Chinese law enforcement all, always from, you know, cracking down on dissidents and uh, cracking down on, uh, you know, Internet control. And I think it's, that it's definitely warrants attention. But how are law enforcement actually, um, you know, changing things for the better in the Chinese Internet um, and cracking down on cyber crime and how are cyber criminal communities responding. Second to that is how is China, you know, intelligence apparatus going to shift to support, you know, um, private sector capacity for cybersecurity? And I think that's, that's, that's a major question I, I see over the next year and two years. Things like, you know, how is you know, Chinese CERT going to interact with state security apparatus, how it's gonna, they're going to serve this sort of national database. That sort of... Um, how do I put it, uh, anodyne but still important side of cybersecurity, how is that going to work in China? I think that's, that's an uncovered aspect, and I, I look forward to looking into that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you agree with me. This has been absolutely fantastic. So please join me thanking Paul Triolo, Graham Webster, Sam Sachs, and John Costello. And we didn't even mention Bitcoin. <laughs>